People sometimes get the longer security clearance process than the average American because of their last name or a sister wearing hijab, she will be asked to remove that hijab during her bar exam. Thus, whether it be for black imams or a girl wearing hijab, their name or physical appearance is associated with Islam, and thus they face the repercussions of their racialized religious identity, which carries the negative affiliations with terrorism, disloyalty, and permission to violate their personal rights and freedoms. Even for black imams, they fall into a shade of being brown in these instances as a result of being Muslim and having their religion conflated with the Middle East and South Asia. So in accordance with the existing racial dynamics of America, an initial differentiation between blacks and whites continues to be a strong mechanism by which the experiences of black Muslims are shaped. Uh, Ahmed is a black Muslim and an imam of the largest mosque affiliated with the W.D. Muhammad community in Detroit. He says, with the African American, we're so highly visible. You know, you take off that scarf and no one knows who you are, but me, they know who I am automatically. So the racial part of it is a lot more pronounced than religious. Most Caucasians like African Americans as Muslim. As a matter of fact, a lot of them are proud that we are Muslim. He points out a significant aspect of the black Muslim experience. Due to the religious history of black Americans with the Nation of Islam and the community of W.D. Muhammad, black Muslims are not initially affiliated with the same foreign Islam as brown Muslims may be. It is not a new phenomenon for blacks to be Muslim, and it is very much historically American experience as well. Yusuf said, I think generally speaking, conversion to Islam uh, historically was almost an authentication of your blackness for the black American community. And I think there's still some remnants of that to where conversion to Islam for black people is not a, you're not becoming an awful town for sure. Though blacks are more accepted as Muslims in America, the racialized Muslim identity is still significant in how they are profiled. They are not exempt from the prevailing conflation of Islam and a foreign Middle East politics. Jamal said, Quote, we had a little incident in the airport, but that's just part of what happened with the September 11th. My son's name is Yusuf, so Yusuf Jihad. That will probably set off a few triggers, and he's two years old. And they stood him out like this and wanted him pretty much because his name told them to do that. In addition, the experience of Omaima also reflects the inability of black Muslims to completely escape a completion of Islam with a foreign Middle East politics. She is a black female Muslim chaplain who wears a hijab. She said, when I'm speaking with non-Muslims, they're assuming one of two things, that I'm defending a religion that is inherently oppressive, or that I've been kind of brainwashed to believe that Islam offers me liberation as a female, and that I'm believing a fantasy. So it comes out for me in that, not just that I'm Muslim, but I'm female and I'm black. It comes across as people are very incredulous, like, why do you cover it? Did someone tell you to do that? There's always this implied, you're not thinking for yourself. But Shmi says that Islamophobia is implicated in that, that you're not thinking for yourself because you're a woman, you're a Muslim, and you're a black person. So the decisions I may have made in my personal life is kind of open for challenge or analysis because you think I'm wrong. For Umayma, these experiences reflect her racial background as black, as well as her racialized Muslim, uh, religious identity. As a Muslim female, similar to the experiences of another brown Muslim respondent, others make negative assumptions about her experiences because of her Muslim identity. However, she finds it difficult to separate the religious discrimination she faces from her racial identity. Thus, she faces the brunt of certain assumptions about her as a black female, as well as assumptions stemming from the intersection of her race and a racialized Muslim identity. In this instance, Islam is conflated with negative stereotypes of Middle Eastern and any other group who hold fundamental moral and value differences which propagate the oppression of women. So though they may be less strongly associated with a foreign terrorist, Arab, brown Islam in some settings, at a formal level, black Muslims are slightly more accepted but still monitored and not exempt from the impacts of a racialized Muslim identity. It may not be as strange or foreign for blacks to be Muslim, but they are not exempt from the surveillance and potential removal of their civil liberties as a result of being Muslim. Their identity as both black and Muslim brings a unique set of challenges which are compounded. They not only face the scrutiny of being black, but also the scrutiny from being Muslim. They bear the burden of the negative ramifications of both identity statuses and the marginalization that results from these identities. Muslim Americans whose identity is outed are viewed as falling into some shade of brown, thus facing strong repercussions. They bear a burden of representation in which their affiliation with Islam means that they are no longer just an individual themselves, but their actions and opinions reflect that of all other Muslims as well. Ayub says, quote, I think that Muslims live to a large extent this reality of, have you stopped beating your wife yet? 
by which I mean they are in a constant state of apology. If I say yes, I stopped beating my wife, well then that means I was beating my wife before. And if I say no, I stopped beating my wife, that means I'm a wife beater. Whatever I say, I'm subject to coming under indictment, and that's how a lot of Muslims feel in America. They constantly have to explain who they are not instead of who they are, and are thus defining themselves against negative views that are well established and difficult to breach. So in conclusion, their Muslimness becomes brownness, which places them into a hyphen American category that cannot make the same claims for acceptance. Their identity as Muslims becomes salient and at the forefront of how they are judged and deemed as a legitimate to partake in certain socio-political spaces. A discourse of Muslims as not American and therefore not valid citizens has serious consequences for Muslim Americans. Identity boundary making becomes a key part of the process in an effort to maintain a homogenous American identity, not tainted by the inclusion of Muslim Americans. The social structure adapts a rhetoric of moral superiority to justify discrimination against Muslims, arguing Muslims have inherently different and negative moral and value differences. Racialization is a process by which Muslims are represented in, in collective, essentialized identities characterized by the intersections of religion, race, and nationality in ways that are mutually constitutive. These intersections make Muslim Americans high-risk citizens and subtly justify the indiscriminate violation of their civil rights. Federal government policies such as racial profiling and discourses on the war on terror continue to perpetuate Muslim Americans as enemies within the nation. Thus, the process of racialization is a multi-leveled process as it occurs structurally, institutionally, and interpersonally. The degree to which the racially diverse Muslim American community feels the repercussions of their racialized Muslimness varies between black, white, and brown Muslims. White Muslims are able to hide their Muslim identity to some extent, but when it is apparent they are considered cultural apostates and are not exempt from the negative ramifications affiliated with the Muslim community. Black Muslims are not seen as foreign as other Muslims, but their Muslimness still prevails, particularly in engagement with individuals and institutions who have the authority to question the loyalty and threat of Muslim Americans. Finally, brown Muslims are at least able to escape the negative impact of the racialization of Muslims as being brown and being Muslim are mistakenly considered interchangeable. These experiences show the significance of hyphenization, a process in which all non-white Americans are unable to make equal claims to citizenship as a result of the unequal power distribution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our second panelist for today is Professor Saeed Khan. Uh, Professor Khan is a lecturer of Near Eastern and Asian Studies at Wayne State University in Detroit, uh, Michigan, where he's also a fellow at the Center for the Study of Citizenship. His paper is entitled Intersectionality of the Tipping Point in Islamophobia Discourse and the Tipping Point in Western uh, Ontology, colon, Orientalism meets Occidentalism. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Diab, for uh, the introduction, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, for being here. Uh, also, many thanks to uh, Dr. Hatem Bazian, to the IRDP, to the Center for Race and Gender, and uh, to the University of California, Berkeley, for providing yet another excuse for someone from Michigan to come out to the Bay Area. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Uh, it's, it's nice uh, for an annual job here. Uh, my abstract is uh, is available um, with the with the bio, so I invite you to uh, to read that. Uh, in 2000, uh, Malcolm Gladwell authored his best-selling book, uh, The Tipping Point, and in doing so, Gladwell uh, essentially made the title of his tome a household phrase, and in fact, a meme in the public discourse, uh, finding itself even into the uh, the title of the conference theme uh, herein. Uh, in examining whether Islamophobia has reached a tipping point, i.e. a particular moment in time and space where its direction will change identifiably, it may be beneficial to examine whether the current moment is indeed a true tipping point in Gladwellian terms. Gladwell uh, suggests that a tipping point is subject to three rules or laws. One, contagiousness, i.e. the law of the few. Uh, the ability for small causes to have big effects, i.e. its stickiness and instantaneousness, uh, instantaneousness i.e. the law of context. Islamophobia in the current climate in which it exists deserves an analysis through the lens of these three factors as a prerequisite to determining if Islamophobia will thus be subjected to 
a noticeable change in its perception, promotion, and promulgation. But first, any study of Islam in the so-called West is colored by an assessment, of course, of Occid uh, um, Orientalism. But any such narrative requires a view of the West itself qua Occidentalism. In their eponymous book, Barama and Mar uh, Marbellet examined Occidentalism through a series of extreme anti-Western views that have emerged within the West itself and then been permeated into the non-West, especially the so-called Muslim world. Thus, Occidentalism bears similarity to Orientalism in that both are constructions originally emanating from the West. Agency for defining either appears to be reserved and preserved for Western voices, or at least voices that are located in the West. Irrespective of the attempts to privilege the voices of genuine and acceptable discourse of it, Occidentalism is still an important methodological lens to assess the West and its discontents as a Hegelian positivist narrative of exclusivity because it is a sound entrenched criticism and critique to Western exceptionalism. Now, as in prior conferences, uh, I've mentioned how Islamophobia in the United States does uh, exist uh, within a broader sociological context. It is symptomatic of what Cohen would argue is a moral panic internalized by many of the shifting demographic, social, economic, and political trajectories of the nation. As America moves closer to this point, estimated to be in 2043 when it becomes a majority minority country, the anxieties surrounding a perceived loss of power and perhaps the concomitant tremor to white privilege, the public rhetoric is becoming increasingly toxic. The uh, reactions intensify in their acerbity and even lead to violence. While Islamophobia is now a ubiquitous and accepted ingredient of electoral discourse, so too is both the dogma and action among other suspect groups seen as members of the so-called other to the essentialization of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant heterosexual America. And we see this happening three years ago in North Carolina, where for the first time since Reconstruction, uh, the state became a single party state, meaning the governor and the legislature were both of the same party, uh, um, Republican in this case. And in the absence of any critical mass capable of amounting an opposition, in the summer of 2013, they passed SB 695, which was known as an anti-Sharia bill, and yet at the 11th hour, they snuck in a rider that uh, limited uh, reproductive rights access for women. Uh, of course, they realized that no one was going to really uh, uh, launch much of an objection or uh, protestation against uh, Sharia, so this was uh, perhaps uh, an insight as to what their true legislative agenda was. Uh, they certainly used the public hysteria about Sharia as a smokescreen for other attempts at disenfranchisement, namely in this case, uh, reproductive rights, but they did not stop there. A few weeks ago, the same legislature decided to target other quote-unquote dangerous demographic groups uh, in House Bill 2, uh, known as the Public Facilities Privacy and Security Act, which bars transgender people from using the restroom of their self-identification, forcing them to use the facility of their biological gender at birth. It is reasonable to infer that part of the impetus for this law is the frustration generated in many conservative locales throughout the country with last year's United States Supreme Court case, Obergefell versus Hodges, which legalized same-sex marriage. Given the unconstitutionality of various efforts by some states to circumvent, ignore, or defy the holding in Obergefell, legislation that appears vindictive in its motivation has gained currency throughout the country, and it seems as though that's also the case here in North Carolina. But this is, of course, piggybacking on the fact that they were already emboldened in passing such legislation three years ago with SB 695. So what we find then is that Muslims are, in many ways, the canaries in the coal mine, proverbially, when it comes to targeting certain groups in uh, anti-progressive legislation. But it's important also to remember that Muslims are not the only birds being put down the mine shaft. Those who dread the impending demographic turn in the United States argue that this eventuality constitutes an existential threat to the nation. And it's important to then recognize this demographic turn in a broader context as what Charles Kupchen calls a global turn, which then helps him, um, explain and inform why the so-called West is having these multiple anxieties concurrently as to what they see as an erosion of power. Uh, what they suggest is also a similar ontological crisis that is now gripping Europe. 
The European Union, the magnum opus and culmination of the West tradition of Enlightenment philosophy and its concomitant secularity, liberal democracy, and tolerance, is facing its potential ephemerality. Now, while this paper will not scrutinize the merits of Europe's own adherence to its stated values, it's important to examine how those principles have manifested in the construction of the EU itself. And it seems as though there are multiple so-called fires aflame in Europe, especially over the last few years. Uh, the Eurozone being one of the major ones. Uh, this grand design of having, having a singular currency is now in peril thanks to what the Europeans themselves call the pigs countries. Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, each of which has had a major financial default at a certain time. Now, of course, it's important to recognize and remember that the initial country that had a default was Iceland. But apparently for Europe, uh, Iceland is too northern. To